<clears throat> Good morning and welcome to Morning Light with Russ and Kitty Walden. We have Christian Elisha Allen Davis here, our 12 year old grandson. Say hi, Christian. Hi. <laughs> We're having a couple fun days with Nanny and Papa. We are studying today in Exodus chapter 33. And Colossians 1, 26 and 27 tells us the core focus of Paul's ministry from, in his own words, according to him, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He said, who we teach, warning every man, instructing every man about who he is on the inside of you. He considered that, <coughs> excuse me, the core of his gospel. In Exodus chapter 33 is about relating to the glory, not offending the glory, the consequences of offending the glory, and the fidelity of God toward his word even when we fall short, and the implications of that for us. We're going to learn some things about the people of God in the wilderness with Moses. Uh, they get a bad rap because they, their, their bones bleached in the wilderness because of unbelief. The generation that came out of Egypt with Moses, not one of them except Joshua and Caleb, not one of them came in to the promised land. But does and we tend to use them as a negative stereotype or an or a uh, archetype of of unbelief. But there were some things they did where they got it right, even in times of disobedience. There was something in their character that I believe we've overlooked that we're going to see today, that will bring their example a lot closer to home, in our in our own lives, in our own experience with God. What would you do? If God basically handed you a blank check <laughs> and said, everything everything you ask me I'm going to do, everything I ever promised you is going to be fulfilled, but I'm not going to be with you. Wow. wow. And, and it gives you pause. Think about that. <laughs> How many people, you know, uh, people come to us all the time and their approach to the prophetic is, uh, let me know what God's going to do for me. There's two, two approaches that we get, very common. Many of, them, many of you write in and you say, uh, just tell me what God wants of my life. Tell me what, what God wants me to do. But then others, and quite honestly in the majority, many that will say, just, just tell me what God's going to do for me. Tell me what God's going to do about my situation. It's two different approaches, and it kind of depends on the pressure that's on your life at a, at a given time. Uh, but let's begin reading in Exodus 33, and uh, let's see what the Lord has to say to us about His glory, about His promises, about the what happens to His promises when we fall short. We think that God says, okay, that's it, I made you a promise, but you've disobeyed, therefore you're not going to get anything. But that is not what happened in Exodus chapter 33. The one scripture in the New Testament says... Uh, we might deny him, but he cannot deny himself. God's going to be faithful to his word. That doesn't mean there's not implications of disobedience. But God's going to be faithful regardless. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you'd read, Kitty, uh, verses 1 through 3, and we'll start there. Chapter 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. I did it, honey. Yay! <laughs> Those are normal. <laughs> Unto the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Wow. Now, imagine that. <laughs> I'm going to give an angel personal custodianship of your life for the rest of your life to cause you to inherit every single promise I've ever made. Notice he didn't say my angel. In some places, God says, I will send my angel. Mm -hmm. 
and other and here, but here he said, "I will send an angel." So it's it's, it's different. The angel there is God, the angel that God refers to as my angel or his angel that I believe is connected to his presence, the angel of his presence. And so what a tremendous promise with one caveat. I'm not going with you. Think about that. Just go ahead. Wow. Just attend church. Love your family. Live your life. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to cause everything you do and everywhere you go, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to have supernatural favor and blessing everywhere you, you go, but I will withhold intimate relationship from you. You think about that. No, thank you. And the pressures <laughs> of life, you know, it kind of gives you pause. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see what, what their response is. But the, I want to spend a little time talking about God, the pro promises of God. Because in, in Christian tradition, we say God makes a promise. But if we disobey, all bets are off. He won't keep his promise. But that is not what this verse uh, what this verse says so let's uh, why don't you read those verses again I had a little technical difficulty okay so the Lord said to Moses depart and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land I swear unto Abraham Isaac and Jacob saying unto thee thy seed will I give it and I will send my angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Okay. Just bear with me. We've never had a technical difficulty in this broadcast before. We're breaking through, sweetie pie. <laughs> In an interesting couple of weeks of warfare here, based on this meeting we're going to have. So, we win. We play till we win. So the verse starts out very positive. If you, if he had not said, there in uh, in verse verse three, if he had not ended. He actually begins in verse 3. He says, and I'm going to do all this for you, bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And if he'd stopped there, they they would have had a party. <laughs> yeah. They would have, I'm going to do all these things for you. But then he, he, just, he just adds almost as an afterthought, but I'm not going to go with you. So it starts out very positive. God giving the green light to every promise he had made from Abraham. He started out from Abraham down to the present day. And we see that the the reflection of that, why God is obviously not happy. But just because he's displeased does not mean he's not going to be faithful to his word. You see, there's a difference between acceptance and approval. God, there are things that accrue to you because God accepts you. Those are the things that Jesus said, take no thought. What are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Creature comforts. We think God will withhold those things. In Christian tradition, we think God will withhold those things when he's upset with us because he's trying to teach us something. But there are things that accrue to you. Most of the things that Christians stress over wondering if God's going to do, in the scriptures, those things are promised to you on the basis of God's acceptance because he has chosen to be your God. Disobedient or no, it's like my children growing up. Uh, I always accepted them. They could sleep under my roof. They could eat at my table. But I didn't always approve of them. So they could come. I could be totally disapproving of choices they were making. And they could still come sit at my table. But if they sat at the table and asked for the keys to the car, I would say no. And why would I say no? Some things come to my children because I accept them as my children. Some things come to them because I approve of them. See, destiny comes on the basis of God's approval, but there are many, most of the things that Christians struggle with receiving from God and believing God for are the things that God has written a blank check to before the foundation of the world. That's true, isn't it? And that's why we see these open-ended faith statements that when you read them in the Bible, they're given without qualification. But when, you, when they're taught on in the pulpit, they're, they're always... Uh, 
couched in language something like this. God always answers prayer, but sometimes he says no. That's a despicable lie. He will never say no to those things that the cross says yes to. But yet we teach that. Well, if that person had been in a different place with God, maybe they might have received their healing. That sounds so rational, and it is so despicable, and it's a charge against the faithfulness of God. Here was a people who were going to pay dire consequences for their unbelief, but at the same time, every morning they got up with the murmuring in their mouth, they did so with a basket full of manna right in front of them. They had, uh, they were, uh, had complaint in their heart, but yet they did so drinking water that came supernaturally out of a rock. They were upset because they weren't, uh, God wasn't doing what they wanted them to do. But they were cool and comfortable under a cloud by day and warmed by fire by night. The acceptance of God. Let's get past those things that accrue to us because of God's acceptance. And let's focus on the things that, that uh, seeking God's approval, which is talked about later on in this chapter. But let's read a couple of verses. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto them, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Amen. Now, Christianity adds caveats to that. We say, if you can believe the words of Jesus. Open-ended faith statements that if we had made them, if we had said something like this without it being in the scripture, you'd be accused of excess. You'd be accused of hyper-faith. You'd be accused of, of uh, making statements that were not accurate to the character of, of uh, the gospel as it's interpreted in modern day. But I just want you to see, no, no caveat. No if, in the, in the statement, if you can believe, all things are possible. Here's another one. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And it's interesting, the, the wording there, if you look at the Greek tense, it actually means ask and keep on asking. Mm -hmm. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Is that because God's deaf? No, but sometimes we have to get, we have to process our unbelief. Mm -hmm. So we start out asking, and then in the in the continual asking, we refine our faith, and then through faith, the answer comes. Mm -hmm. But notice the open-ended statement. It didn't say, "But now here's another one." Well, God will give you what you need, but He won't give you what you want. Are you kidding me? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who daily ladeth thee with good things. I have prepared a table for you in the midst of your enemies. Abraham. Abraham came out of Egypt and said he was rich. He was very rich in goods and gold and sheep and manservants and maidservants. It didn't say he came out of Egypt and thank God got his food stamp application uh, approved. Thank the Lord. That is not what he said. But that would have been all he needed. All he needed was food in his stomach, but God did much more than that. And if they did that under the shadow of the old covenant, how much more so under the substance of the new? This whole idea of, and you hear this time and time again, well, God, he'll give you what you need. Mm -hmm. is, do you really think God is operating on a budget? What possible gain could God have, ethereal, practical, or otherwise, in just put, put, putting you down on barely get along street? That's not even in disobedience. There are there is a baseline faithfulness of God that encompasses about ninety percent of everything you will ever ask Him for. <laughs> you see, in dealing with these open-ended faith statement faith statements, we see the means by which God limits His own sovereignty. God limits his sovereignty where answered prayer is concerned. He does not give himself the option of not answering the clear promises of the word of God. That's why he put them in past tense many times. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Here's the big one about healing. But he says, by his stripes you were healed. Hebrews chapter 1 says God is in this day, used to speak um, in times past through the prophets and the law, but now is spoken through His Son. So everything God has to say, He says through the lens of who Jesus is. 
Did Jesus ever refuse to heal somebody? He was so willing to heal people that if they just got to him without his knowledge and touched him, they'd get healed. He was a touchstone of healing. Many times he turned around and he said, well, I didn't get to you, but your faith had made you whole. Mm -hmm. Because they drew upon him even without his volition. Much less the times he said, Master, that I could receive my sight. And he said, I will. His answer to anything short of perfect divine health for you is yes. Well, how come we're not seeing it? You cannot allow your experience to speak with more authority than, than the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We receive these things through faith. How come uh, if I get up in the morning and I'm very thirsty and three hours later I'm still thirsty, what's the problem? I've got water mm -hmm. from the city of Branson here in my house because I did not follow the process. There is a process involved and many times people don't like that. That water in there in that sink is a now resource in my life and I can quench my thirst anytime I choose to align myself with the process. I have to get up from this couch, go in there, get a glass down from the, from the cabinet, and turn the water on. There is a means by which we receive what's available to us. And because it's not preached, why? Because it creates this, uh, this tension between our experience and the emotional, out, um, the emotional fallout of our experience and the promise of God. You know, you know, it's enough to people be suffering and then to be taught that they're falling short because there's something else available. You know, there's something in the flesh that says I'm suffering and there's no other choice. And I guess I'll just attach some ethereal value to this. I'm suffering in this hospital bed so I can be a witness. God put me here so I can be a witness to the nurses. How many times have I seen people die of cancer? And they sit there and preach, and the, and the pastor walks away, and the people walk away trying to justify what they saw by saying, look at all the people who were one to the Lord by that person. That's wonderful. You should love God and be a witness for God no matter what you're going through. You don't stop being God's man or God's woman just because you're going through suffering. But God does not engineer suffering. He will not put on you. He will never say no. To what the cross says yes to. Kitty says he won't put sickness on you. Because he doesn't have any. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no poverty in heaven. So, so the, the opposite outcome is. These people were in disobedience. These people were in revolt against God. And God's answer is. Okay I'm going to answer all your prayers. But I'm not going with you. And that shows you that God's going to. The, the accountability in this area is the fact that God will respond, but there are unexpected consequences. I'm going to do everything you ask me to do, but I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to give you the intimacy with me that you that that uh, you were scheduled for. So just go on ahead, have your promises, go on ahead, live the overcoming life, but I'm going to preclude you from the intimacy. And the destiny of, in my presence that you were accorded. What a somber thought. Heartbreaking. See, Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Hello. It doesn't say the blessing of the Lord puts you on food stamps. Hello. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. And it adds no sorrow with it. This was not God's perfect plan. Because it was adding some sorrow with it. <laughs> Psalm 106 15 says, He gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. Mm. In other words, they were getting everything they wanted. And how many times, you know, in our ministry, traveling from coast to coast and now around the world, we've met many aff very affluent people. We've met people who live their lives every day in the most astonishing mm. opulence, I mean, I knew, I'm not, uh, I'm not unexposed to the world out there, Kitty and I. We've seen nice houses, nice things, but we've walked in some houses that just, I didn't know this kind of opulence existed. But you know what? When you get to know those people, and we've had a sweet opportunity to minister to these people, to love them. It's one of the things that's amazed me is being, uh, not being born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I, uh, you know, you you have a uh, you have a idea about what people who are upper class 
how they might feel about spiritual things. I found that the affluent are, many times are more hungry for God Amen. than people who are in uh, lower, lower economic standing. And I think that's because people that are in a lower economic standing think money is going to solve their problems. Mm -mm. And people who don't have money problems like what the average person might experience, uh, they know money doesn't solve a problem. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade my life for the lives of some of the most affluent people I've ever met because their lives reflect uh, uh, struggles that you cannot anticipate. So he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. So you better be careful how you ask. What am I saying is, God's going to answer your prayer. The question is not, God is God going to answer my prayer? The question is, you better you, are you going to be... Um, cautious of how you ask, knowing that he's going to answer. Peter asked Jesus a question. Sometimes we do this. Peter asked Jesus a question there was only one answer to. You ever pray like that? Lord, if you love me, you'll see that that credit application to buy that new Cadillac gets approved. If you love me, Lord, you'll do that for you. And it goes through. And, you know, nine months later, they're, you know, they're picking it up you're on an episode where one of them guys is coming to picking up your vehicle out of your driveway. Well, I know God gave that to me. Yes, he did. You asked him a question there was only one answer to. Peter was standing in the bow of the boat. Jesus is walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Matthew fourteen twenty eight. Jesus is like, well, it's me. Come on. <laughs> he didn't say he wanted, he didn't say he thought Peter was going to make it. He knew Peter wasn't going to make it. And notice that, that he still bailed him out. Oh, I've done that, Brother Walden. I've asked those. That's okay. He's going to bail you out. He'll be there to pull you out of the water like Peter. Can't you see him with his pride and his ego? You know, <laughs> Jesus is handing him up to them disciples that were shaking their head. We told you not to get jump over the rail. <laughs> and he's laying there spitting and sputtering, half drowned. And Jesus isn't rebuking him. He's loving him. But you better be careful how you ask. You see, these people would rather have stayed in the wilderness with God's presence mm -hmm. than seen every promise God had ever made to them fulfilled without it. If you read verses 4 through 8. And when the people heard these evil tidings, yeah, see, they even knew they were evil, they mourned, and no man did put on, on him his or ornaments. And the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people, and I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thine ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and he called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass, when Moses went out into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Now what was the cost of intimacy with God. If you see why God withdrew himself, notice he never withdraws his promise, but he does withdraw his presence. So let's, it's like the Lord told me one time, he said, how come every time you and I have a conversation, I have to get past your unbelief? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> See, there comes a point, let's just get past whether or not he's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Let's get past whether or not he's going to pay the bills. Let's get past whether or not he, he is purposing to define your life by the, by the template of heaven on earth. Let's just get past all that mm -hmm. and begin to walk in it. Let's just go ahead and be blessed and then let's put our focus. That's what he meant when he said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added. In other words, he's done, he's done signed off. On anything other than seek the kingdom. Whatever's, what is biblical prosperity? Having enough to do the will of God and plenty left over to help somebody else do the will of God. Amen. Having enough so that your life can comparatively be defined by what Abraham experienced. He was rich, he was very rich, and he'd just come out of Egypt 
where God brought the Pharaoh to his knees, plagued his house. Why? Because he got duped by a lie that Abraham told. And here Abraham had sold his wife Sarah into Pharaoh's harem. Oh, that isn't what he did. Why do you think the scripture says Sarah by faith called Abraham Lord and was not afraid with any amazement? Hello? <laughs> because every time she turned around that she was so good looking that Abraham was lying on her. Abraham was using her beauty for his own financial gain. When you use a woman's beauty for financial gain, that's called being a pimp. And Abraham faltered, got into unbelief every time where his wife's beauty was concerned. And when he came out of that situation, not only did he, you think he'd come out now, God's going to let him have it. Abraham, you're going to the woodshed. You're in trouble now. And if you read the story in Genesis, you will, find, you will not find one rebuke from God. Not one, because that was his boy. In fact, when he came out, that's when it began to define how wealthy Abraham was, how blessed he was, even in his disobedience, in the most embarrassing moment where he defamed God the most was when the blessing of God was greatest upon his life. Would, would you call that allowances and concessions? <laughs> it's exactly. It's the, to it's the toleration <laughs> yes. of God. So we can get past all of that, but let's look at why God, the one thing that God retained his sovereignty as regarding his own presence and his intimacy. Mm -hmm. And what was the problem? What was it about them? It was they were stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Mm -hmm. Stubborn. What were they stiff-necked about? What had just happened previously in the previous chapter, Abraham, I'm sorry, Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. They got restless and said, let's go back to Egypt. In other words, they formed an opinion. How many times do we get stiff-necked about our opinion? We get stubborn about our opinion. We want what we want. We want it now. And if we don't get it, we're going to be. We're going to complain. We're going to be upset. In other words, it was not acquiescing. That's what Jesus was referring to. He was. It was not the gospel according to Rodney King in Matthew seven one when he said, "Judge not that you be not judged." The word "judge" there means handed down an opinion. What the children of Israel at Horeb should have been doing, waiting on Moses, was having no opinion. But they decided to have an opinion. And when you decide to have an opinion, look what they did. They decided to have an opinion. And we talked about it yesterday. Then when you decide to have an opinion, you get a better idea. And when you get a better idea, you look for an alternative. Oh, forget Moses, let's grab Aaron. And then when you grab Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, you, want to you, you come up with uh, your own solution. Yeah. Uh, let's have a golden calf. Remember, there's always a, a young calf ready to jump out of the fire of God. <laughs> I've got the answer. I'll let you have it your way without any responsibilities. Mm. I'll let you do, I'll let you have what your opinion is saying must, must happen. So it was their opinions that was separating them uh, from God. But at the same time, these people were grieved that God was withdrawing his presence. Even though they all eventually died in the wilderness, they were not willing to go into the land of promise without God's presence with them. And the, notice, they got it. What do you do? Okay, Brother Walden, you got my attention. I'm probably going through some of that. What do I do? Well, notice hey, Moses told them, take your ornaments off of you. What do ornaments represent? Distractions. Mm, yeah. Distractions. Yeah. Remember we talked about how that it has to do with wanting to look at something that shines. Mm -hmm. There's always something, somebody shiny out there. Let's go shopping. Let's get something shiny. We don't need any clothes. We got clothes, but we want something shiny. How many times do you get bored? You're upset. You need a break. You need to decompress. Let's go shopping. Or let's turn on the TV. You know, the TV is something, is something uh, shiny. Uh, but he says, take off your ornaments. And then I think of, uh, and I think it's happened so many times over 30 years, multi-level marketing, people approaching you about a different scheme, a different pyramid, and it's always, always, always been a distraction if you go for it. And we learned a long time ago, don't even go there. But that's another, yeah. uh, you know, taking, making your own opinion about something else that might be all right. Coming up with a better idea. Better idea. God's blessing isn't coming. Yeah. And how are we going to deal with that? Yeah. Try an alternative. It. Try... Some sort of uh, alternative approach by which we get distracted away from what Kitty calls seeking first Amen. the kingdom. So Moses says, take your ornaments off. Let's just remove all the distractions. Mm -hmm. 
And let's just wait. Let's wait on God. That can be excruciating. (laughs) Moses goes into the tabernacle to consult the Lord. And I want you to notice what the people did. They all came and they stood at the door of their tents. What that speaks to me is... uh, Go ahead and read through verse 11. 9 through 11. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloud pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto a friend. And he turned again unto the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So Moses is in the tabernacle consulting with the Lord, and you are the tabernacle. Remember, we've shown this throughout Exodus. They had a tent in the wilderness, but the scripture teaches over and over again, you are the tabernacle of God. You are the temple of God. If you're going to go into the tabernacle, that means you go into your prayer closet and you do what Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. If they say, lo, here is Christ, lo, there is Christ, lo, here is the word of the Lord, lo, there is the word of the Lord. No, you need to go get the word of the Lord in your own tabernacle and then you see the the children of israel they're standing in the doors of their tents to me that is men standing up with their families being put on their own recognizance we're, we're going to put aside all of this distraction we're going to focus on one thing hearing from god mm-hmm. boy it, it goes back to when i worked for a denomination and uh, my founder used to talk about this when he'd preach he'd talk about how p- pastors many times get a call from somebody and pastor, my life is a mess. My kids are running riot. My marriage is falling apart. Would you please pray for me? I, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Walmart. Mm. <laughs> That's not standing in the door of your tent. Right. What would it be like? You know, and you know, <laughs> the state of Christian culture today is 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 unfortunate. And I hear stories constantly. We hear what what people go through, and it's not universal, but but it is quite common the condition of our leadership, the condition of our churches. But I want you to see something. These people were in trouble. And for once, they weren't pointing fingers at Moses. They were standing in the door of their tabernacle and watching the man of God go into the Lord. What if we did that? What if that's what we wanted our pastors to do? Mm. I don't care whether they're out there visiting. I don't care whether they're out there putting together some new gospel pony show for Sunday morning. All that matters is let me let me take responsibility for what's happening under my roof and let us put our spiritual focus on our pastor, our leader, hearing from God. Amen. Lord, that you'd take him into the tabernacle this week and that he commune with you face to face like Moses. And when he comes into the church on Sunday, let it not be with all of the accoutrements of some religious entertainment program, but with the anointing of God that changes us as a people because He's heard from heaven and because we stood by him as he sought the Lord. And many of the churches that we know of um, throughout the nation, uh, if you could just, if we could just pray and provide the salary that the pastor can stop working a secular job and devote himself wholly to the work of the kingdom, like was it Brother Lester Summerall said to you? Yeah. <laughs> you were wor- he was worried about, Russ was worried about having a job and trying to pastor. And Lester said to him one day, uh, what if you worked as hard at one as you did the other? Which yeah. is the truth. If the, if the kingdom people could provide for their pastors and they wouldn't be out there building houses during the week, they could be presenting themselves before the Lord. God knows what could happen. Hard saying. I was a young pastor. I had had a family, I had kids, I had responsibilities. I was working a full-time job and pastoring a church full-time as and just doing two full-time jobs very demanding. And here's Lester Summerall, one of the greatest men of God that I've personally ever had the opportunity to meet. And I I asked him a question, you know, about they've got a fancy word for that. It's called, "Oh, my pastor's bivocational." Bivocational. <laughs> And so I asked him about that, and I thought he was going to, you know, the elder apostle was going to say something comforting to the young preacher. He said, <laughs> well, I just feel sorry for you. And boy, a sword in my heart. Man with two vocations, maybe if you worked it hard, as hard at the one as you did it at the other, at two of them, uh, you might not need to have that second job. Oh, I was pierced. I felt like Mary, who's, who said her, her, 
her heart was pierced through with a sword, but it's what I needed because I stepped out in faith. Amen. My daddy always told me, go into the full-time ministry, don't you ever look back. Amen. And I stepped out. There's many of you listening. You want to be full-time in ministry. And you got to get past this idea like the guy that came to me and said, I'm tired of working for a living. I'm going into the ministry. Oh, my goodness. I bit my tongue. (laughs) You know. Oops. And or the, the, the preacher's kid talking to the uh, neighbor over the back fence. They just moved into this house. Oh, my daddy doesn't work for a living. He's a preacher. <laughs> it's like my, my mommy doesn't work. She's at home. <laughs> and uh, we know the truth. But so girls. true, the attitude they had. It's like uh, Virgil Johnson, great apostle, now gone on to heaven. He preached a message at my church one time about loosing a man of God. Peter was in the prison. And he was bound between uh, in chains. And we know the story. The angels come and got him out. But it said prayer was made by the church for Peter. Amen. And Virgil preached the message. Is your pastor bound by chains? Is your pastor held back? Is his anointing suppressed? Come on. Well, this is how you loose a man of God. And then, of course, when you loose the man of God, he came and knocked on their door. And they couldn't believe it was him. And that happens many times. You pray for revival in your church. God energizes your pastor. He turns into another man. And all of a sudden you decide that you need to vacate the pulpit. Because I don't know where our pastor went, but this ain't him. But you got what you prayed for. Oh, my. And Moses is communing with God face to face. Every time God speaks to me in dreams and visions, I say, thank you very much. I want to humble myself to what you're saying. But let me remind you that it, it just, it makes me mad. When I've heard from God in a dream, the first thing I tell Kitty is, it makes me mad. Because he said he would commune with us face to face, not through dreams and visions. So I will take dreams and visions. But to me, dreams and visions are necessary because of my own immaturity. I want what Moses had. I want a face to face relationship with God. How about you? Amen. Amen. Now if you read verses 12 through 14. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now something changed. God, Moses says something to God, and all of a sudden God changes his mind. Oh, okay, I will go with you. <laughs> Doesn't that seem a little capricious on God's part? Wouldn't that get you a little frustrated? You know, and you ask the Lord, why are you doing this? Because I'm God, I know more than you do, and I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> because I'm God, I know more than you do, and I'm bigger than you are. But what was it? God relents and agrees to lead the people out of the wilderness and to go with them after all. What changed his mind? One thing. It was one man, Moses, that said one simple thing to God. He said, show me your way that I may know you. Mm. And I could see God with his arms folded and he, he nods his head. That's what I was waiting for. Okay, I'll go with you. Come on. In other words, not because they were perfect, but because they were willing to learn. The approval again. You know, right now, learning means God teach me what I don't know. Yeah, you see, God, the people say, God will never speak contrary to His word. That is the most arrogant statement I've ever heard in my life. Because what you're really saying is, God will never speak contrary to your understanding of the word, and that's something that God will often do, He will do with frequency. Because we don't know it all. If you limit your idea of God to what you understand, then God is only capable uh, of producing where you've been. But if you want what you've never had before, and you want to go where you've never been before, and you want to do what you've never done before, you better be willing to get on out into uncharted territory (laughs) for God to provoke you in areas where you have taught and even preached. And said, God will never do this. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you how many times I've filled a 50-gallon barrel with my teachings and tapes, poured lighter fluid on it, and set it on fire? Can I tell you how many emails I've sent out to people? Oh, boy, I shouldn't have said that. Because people go Google this, and they'll find stuff I've written. I have emailed things. And and, I, and people have taken my teachings and put them on their websites. And I go back a couple of years later and say, man, I wish I could take that down. Mm-hmm. And they're quicker to put them up than they are to take them down. Mm-hmm. That's 30 years ago. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, some of it's still out there. And But 
show me your way. Now, what, what's he saying there? Well, Psalm 103, 7 says, God made his ways, known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. In other words, I don't want to see it past tense. I don't want to see what God's doing after everybody's figured it out. Frank Bartleman uh, was a part of the Azusa Street Revival, and he made this statement. He said, when they put the sign Azusa Street Mission on the building, the revival was over. In the pool of Bethesda, the angel came and stirred the water, and the first person of thousands, the first person that got in, got healed. Everybody else just got wet. Water represents doctrine. In any revival, the first people in get the substance. Everybody else just gets the doctrine when they decide to gild the lily about what God's already done and moved on. Yeah. See, I want to know His ways. I want to. I want to be there when God shows up. On the cutting edge. I want to, when God's ready to do something, I want to be standing right there ready to participate. I want to be holding the door for him. I've been waiting on you. I just knew you were going to show up because of what you taught me. I knew who you were. And participate in the substance of what God is doing. And then to be following him on into the uncharted territory, the unvalidated, incredible uh, uh uh, geography of the spirit where he's going next while everybody else is having a camp meeting over what he did six weeks ago. Mm, Jesus. I want to know his Somehow, ways. God, huh? <sighs> yes, thank you, God. It's burning hot. <laughs> and God, and that one thing, the Lord heard it. Because God said, That's right. You're slated for intimacy. I'm going to go with you. I don't want just, I don't just want the dividends. Of his promises in my life. I want intimacy. It's like that scripture. The Song of Solomon. The very first verse. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. For thy love is better than wine. Amen. I want something more. Than the words that the lips speak. I want Amen. intimacy with the lips. That spoke those words. How about you? Glory to God. That's what I want. If you read verses 15 through 17. And he said unto him. If thy presence go not with me. Carry us up. Not, not up thence. And for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us, in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. I'm powerful. I know your name. Tell about the day you found out the Lord knew your name. Oh gosh, this is so exciting. I had only been a spirit-filled believer for uh, a few months, maybe nine months, and I'd had this call of God on me since I was nine years old and preached. And and um, and when I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I was in my early twenties, and I hadn't um, I hadn't had a lot of training in the gifts of the Spirit, but I was so ready for whatever God wanted to say and do in my life. And um, I went to a Women's Aglow meeting in this little town, Camarillo, California. And I was sitting in the back of the room because I had um, I was a nanny. I did daycare at my house. In order to supplement my banking income, I took in children. So I had 12 kids at home, and I had to slip out about 10 minutes before noon when the service was going to end just to get back to feed the children with my helper. So I go home, and in about 20 minutes after I'm home, my phone rings. And the president of that Glow chapter said, Kitty, you won't believe what has happened. And I said, what has happened? And she said, this lady, Lois Burkett, came from Arizona to this California meeting, unbeknownst to me. I didn't know her. I'm in the back of the room, 200 women. She said, she said, um, before I pray for everybody, she said, I, I got something in my heart and you're going to have to help me out, ladies. She said, is there a kitty here or has she gone? And I just nearly melted in a pile on the floor listening to that woman on the phone say what she said because I knew the Bible says your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But that day I knew that I knew that I knew that I was in there. And uh, within two years, I was the president of that Women's Aglow chapter. <laughs> So here Moses expresses the sentiment of the entire nation. God has told them, I'm not going with you. Right. I'm going to answer every prayer you, you have, but I'm not going with you. And then he relents because Moses is willing to say, Lord, teach me your ways. You know, that's a level of maturity. I hear the Lord say many times, you're going to have to come up here to me. Come I'm on. not coming down there to you. Come on. I'm not going to talk to you 
if I have to get past 30 minutes of unbelief in order to have a conversation. Mm. There comes a time, folks, that you have to grow up. Yeah. To grow up into a place of understanding God's ways. And then Moses just follows up with it. He said, now I'm just reminding you. I know you said you weren't going and now you said you are. But let me just make it clear so you understand how we feel. <laughs> if you are not going with us into the land of promise, then take us not hence. Wow. And that very statement is ultimately as it was played out because every person that came out of Egypt that stood before Horeb, every one of them died in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But they would have rather died in the wilderness with the presence of Come God on. than gone into the land of Canaan without it. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you, I've done my time in the wilderness. I'd rather be in the wilderness. I've done my time in the wilderness. I thought it defined my life. I spent many, I spent decades in a spiritual wilderness. And I thought that would define my life. I was an obscurantist. I'd have conversations. People couldn't understand what I was saying. I couldn't get across things. I'd have tears streaming down my face. And my dearest friends would look at me and say, Well, the Lord quickened it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frustrated, empty, agonizing. Had a call on my life. But no opportunity to fulfill it. But I would have rather, I would have rather died there with God's presence mm -hmm. than to gone into some... Uh, Empty fulfillment where outward things were successful, but no inward registration of the reality of God and intimacy with God in my life. Amen. And then out of that came a revelation of God's glory. And if you'd read verses 18 through 23. And he said, I beseech thee, show, the, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, boy, I love that about God. God can do anything he wants, anytime he wants, and he doesn't have to check in with anybody. That just shows his sovereignty once again. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there, uh, there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, when, while my glory path passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand mm -hmm. while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So here, can you imagine Moses in the cleft of a rock, mm -hmm. and the hand of God comes over him? When you're prepared to know God's ways, there's a level of intimacy previously unavailable to you that you will experience. Are you ready? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock <laughs> and reveals his glory. There's a level of intimacy and relationship. See, the glory that God showed Moses outwardly is the same glory that Christ has made provision to be on the inside of you. We're not looking to some outward apparition. We're not looking to some outward apparition of the supernatural. You have on the inside of you what Paul called the Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Old Testament calls it the kabod, mm -hmm. the weightiness of God. And it is out of that weightiness, Philippians 4, from 10, memory clean. Thank you for... It's that glory, the kabod glory of God, out of which Philippians 4.19 says, all of your needs are met. I'll meet all your needs according to the riches and glory. Notice that everything he'll ever do for you is stored up in an inventory on the glory on the inside of you. He isn't going, when you ask him for something, he says, okay, and he reaches inside of you to pull it out. It's like reaching into a refrigerator to pull something out or into a cabinet. God's not reaching behind his back into something you don't have access to. When you ask him for something, he's reaching on the inside of you to bring that answer. Mm -hmm. To meet all your needs. He will never say no to what he has stored up on the inside of you. And he said he has the answer to every prayer you will ever pray on the inside of you in the glory. Mm -hmm. And it's that kabod glory that you'll see evidence of outwardly in your life. But God wants to draw you into that secret place and give you a level of intimacy 
where he not on where you not, are not only the receive the dividends of the glory, but you begin to have intimacy with that glory and the Christ that it represents. Glory to God. This one of my favorite verses in this chapter, and the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Man, I want to always be in that place that is by him, in him, through him, but it's standing upon a rock that is Christ Jesus. We have permission Amen. to stand, and standing in Christ, who is our hope of glory. Father, help us today to be an example of what intimacy looks like with you. Let us be that people that walks down the street and suddenly our shadow heals the guy sitting in the wheelchair begging for money. Let us be the light and the glory. Let us be that fragrance today that when people pass us in the mall, they say, excuse me, what is that perfume that you have on? And we didn't put on a fragrance, but we put on Christ and we smell like the Rose of Sharon. We want so much intimacy with you that we life of Christ out of our pores like you showed me that we have millions of pores on our body and you said Kitty I promised that I would pour out of my spirit upon all flesh let us be that glistening glow of your glory Father God that you would receive praise that we could draw attention back to you Jesus that we could introduce people to you Jesus and you would um, br bring the redemption that is so necessary in their lives but help us to be instruments that draw people to your presence and make introduction to you that is the cry of our hearts today help us to be strong in the lord and in the power of your might in jesus christ's name amen